afternoon. Now, we've got a question for you. Disabled Students Allowance, have you heard of it? And the support that it can provide for students in higher education. So this is the topic. This is the question that we're going to be tackling on today's show with Isaac Ampofo, who joins us from A to B Assessments, and we'll be doing a full introduction as we move into the show. So welcome to We Are Careers. This is your fortnightly show of topical careers chat for careers professionals looking to enhance their continuous professional development. Every fortnight, we are going to bring you all of the latest news and updates from the sector and an inspiration to talk about some of the key issues or challenges facing those of us working in the career sector. Uh, my name is Chris Webb. I'm a higher education careers professional uh, and a registered career development professional with the CDI. And as always, I'm joined by my fantastic co-host, Meet Sabir. So, Sabir, how are you doing today? Uh, how are you feeling on this uh, slightly rainy Wednesday up here in Sheffield? Oh, do you know what? I'm feeling really good. I don't know about anybody else, but I had a bit of a break. I know a few of us have been going on holiday. So let us know in the chat if you've taken some time off to reset, recharge, re-energize. Use in the chat box feature as always, because we love hearing from our audiences, whether you're watching live on the live stream right now or you're watching it as a replay. Let us know. And as Chris said, in today's show, we're going to be learning about what DSA is. What's the latest in 2022? And what does that mean for you and your clients? How can they access a plethora of services that are available to them. Now, before I get to Isaac, um, let me just introduce myself. For those of you that don't know me, I'm known as Meet Sabir, and I work internationally helping young professionals get unstuck and get back into career flow without the stress and overwhelm. And I'm also the creator of the I Am Thriving Co um, the career coaching program where I teach international coaches how to help their clients create even more powerful transformations without wasting resources, you know, and who are time poor and need tools that actually work. Now, always, um, we ask you all to sort of, we encourage you, um, you know, if you're enjoying the content that Chris and I create, then please do subscribe, hit that bell button if you're following us on YouTube. And if you can hear and see us, hit that share button and like button. Um, let us know that you're here, you're present and that you're active. Now, each show, we like to kickstart off by giving a shout out. We like to celebrate the newest members of the RCDP members of the CDI community. And we're going to do a quick roundup and give everybody a warm welcome. Now, before I do, and if you're wondering, what is the CDI and how do I become an RCDP member? You'll notice I'm wearing my pin right now. This is one of the benefits that you get, as well as a whole host of other fabulous support that you get from the CDI and its community. And you can head on over to the website to take a look at how you can become a member. Now pop in the chat and come and say hello and also introduce yourself as well and let us know which area of the CIAG are you currently working in and who are we celebrating today? Well, there is a bit of a long list, but here we go. We've got Tracy Kalakaluka, Joanne Soward, we've got Tina Mahone, Lucy Warner, Kay Campbell, Sandra Reynolds, Sue Cross, Alexandra Potter, Amanda Hill, Ashraf, Paralia, Barry McNally, Chris Jolliffe, Colm Fallum, and Emma Webb. Congratulations and welcome. And if you haven't already received your CDI, if you are a member registered, or you're a registered professional, please do head on over to the resources document that comes along with today's show that you'll find in the Facebook community where you can get a hand of, where you can get your hands on your pin. So we're talking to Isaac today. Now, some of you might not be familiar with the DSA and Isaac and the work that he does. So Isaac, what should people know about you and the work that you do? Uh, great, thanks Avia, thanks for that introduction. Um, so yeah, my name's Isaac Mpofa and I work for a company called a to B assessments. We are a study needs assessment company who basically work uh, with students with disabilities studying at higher education. Um, so I'm going to talk a lot about the DSA, Disabled Students Allowance, and, and what it is. And what I think people should know is essentially it's a government fund that's put into place to cover the additional support that students with disabilities um, may incur as a result of their disabilities, really. Um, so essentially it encompasses loads of different support and anyone studying higher education from a level four course and above, so that's foundation and above, can access this fund. Um, and I think for careers, uh, professionals like yourselves, it's really important to kind of get that message out there to help kind of reduce the barriers that some students may face as a result of higher education, because I think it's, a, it's really important to get a good push on 
to actually introduce people to this to this fund and what support is out there available for people. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's yeah, that's what I'm going to try and talk to you guys about today, really. Fantastic. Thanks, Isaac. I mean, I know originally I think this conversation came to us through Chris Target, another member of the careers community who uh, always has his kind of finger on the pulse. And I think even he was extremely surprised by how perhaps little he is a very experienced careers professional, knew about DSA and was very encouraging in, in sort of getting us connected and saying, you know, let's spread this conversation wider. So I think a natural first question, I guess, kind of coming back to what you've said is, for those of our viewers, you know, who are maybe working with students of any age who might be in higher education and, and haven't heard of disabled students allowance, um, what are the key things they need to know and how does the process work, I guess, from a, a student's perspective? Um, so from a student's perspective, it's essentially, I would say, apply as soon as you can. So if you, if you, um, uh, in your last year of, of, of uh, college or secondary school, or even if you're an older student and you're thinking about going back into education, and if you haven't heard of this before, um, go on the government website, type in DSA and, and start the application form straight away. Um, essentially what, what it can provide is additional support. Um, so this support can be specialist equipment such as kind of computers, uh, laptops, assist technology. Uh, it can be non-medical help. So that's potentially someone to help you with your studying, uh, break down assignments, sort of manage your notes, revision techniques. It could be specialist mentoring um, to help with coping strategies, with the stress that comes with being at university, general allowance, travel allowance. There's, there's quite a plethora of support available for students. And when I say students with disabilities, this can be anything that impacts your learning. So it can be uh, dyslexia, dyspraxia, to a mental health condition, to a sensory impairment, to a mobility issue anything that impacts your day-to-day living that could impact your learning, essentially. Um, so in terms of the actual application process, so from start to finish, it can probably take 15 weeks. So that's why I advise students to kind of apply as soon as possible um, and to get on that, that government website. Um, in terms of that application, what does it look like? You're going to need to gather medical evidence straight away. That's the most important thing, really, from a student's perspective. And that medical evidence is just going to be a diagnosis or... Um, from your educational psychologist, depending on what disability you have, just confirming that disability really. Um, mm-hmm. And with that, once you've got that information, that evidence, you can send that to your, your funding body. There's quite a few different funding bodies, but the main one we've been talking about today in England is gonna be Student Finance England. Um, and essentially that's, that's where you're gonna be accessing that fund. And as soon as you go onto that government website, you can actually go through that process. A lot of students will have an online portal now, which they can actually apply for this as well to so make it a lot bit easier. Or you can do it by post as well. You can download mm-hmm. the forms from the government website. So once you've actually applied for student finance and you and or the DSA and you filled out your forms, um, what happens then is your funding body will actually contact you. They'll send you an email or a letter with something called a DSA one, and that is uh, essentially um, an eligibility letter which says that we've received your your medical evidence and your application, and we can confirm that you're eligible for DSA funding. Um, and once you've got that letter, you can actually go start the journey to be assessed uh, and see someone like our, ourselves or any of the other assessments out there uh, to actually get this ball rolling and actually discuss it. Now, an assessment is a bit of a loaded term. I, I don't really, I'm not a massive fan of it. I think when en- anyone mm-hmm. hears assessment, you can be like, oh, it's a bit, it can be, can be a bit intimidating and it's not that at all. Essentially it's a conversation. Uh, so, Chris, for example, if I were to, to use you as my, my student for today and you've come in, sure. say you've applied, you've gone to the government website, you sent your application in, you put your medical evidence through, you filled in their forms, and then a couple of weeks later, you've received that, that, that email from Student Finance and it said, yep, you're good to go for an Estonian assessment. After that, you can contact the, uh, the Estonian assessments company. So this will come from the, web, the government website. Essentially, you put your postcode in and it'll show you your nearest assessment centre. Um, then you can contact this company and say, oh, I'm Chris, I'm, I'm looking to get an assessment. And essentially, the, the, the booking team or the assessment centre will take you through that process of, of booking. So we'll ask you some sort of pre-assessment information just to get a good understanding of your background, what support you've had in the past, where you're looking to go to study. Um, I should say at this point, you don't have to have a confirmation of a university place. And that's why I say to students, apply as soon as you can, uh, because once you're in the system, the ball's rolling and it just makes things a lot easier for you guys to get things processed. So going back to you, Chris, we're in that pre-assessment phase at the moment. We've, you've sent your medical evidence to your assessment centre mm-hmm. and we've discussed sort of your appointment and when you're going to have it. 
Um, when you come in, and it can be a remote appointment or it can be a physical face-to-face -face assessment, depending on your preference, we actually just discuss how that uh, disability impacts your learning, essentially. So like I said, I'll get a good background of what, your, what worked for you at school or when you last studied, and also what doesn't necessarily work so well. And what mm. we'll try to do is discuss that uh, through a conversation. It's a two-way street. So essentially, you'll tell me your experiences, and I'll say, well, actually, I feel like some of this support is funded by DSA can actually help you out. Um, and then we discuss those recommendations with you in the room. There might be some demonstrations. Just there's going to be some assistive technology to help you out. Um, and then you can say, actually, yeah, I think that'd really work for me. Or actually, I'm not sure if that will work for me. Uh, is there anything else that we can discuss? And that's generally how it goes. It's it's certainly not a test. It's definitely not means tested in terms of the funding available as well. And this is something that you don't have to pay back as a student as well. It's not a loan. It's essentially to fund. Um, so that's how it, that's how it works. And, and from that sort of support perspective, Isaac, so, you know, I think when we first sort of talked about it the other week, and I think when I spoke to Chris about it originally, in my head, I guess, because I knew very little about it, I was thinking money. OK, an allowance, it's money, you know, um, chunk of money that you might get. But I, I believe from what you've said, it's kind of quite different. That. It's not just about being given funding, but the support works in quite different ways. Exactly that. So DSA isn't essentially just that money sent to your bank account. No, it's, it's, it's to cover the additional costs of any support uh, that's been recommended for a student. And it's a bespoke service as well. So it's tailored to that individual need of the student. It's not a one size fits all uh, package here at all. It's it's based on that discussion. And that's why that, that assessment is really, really important. Um, in terms of the money, like I said, you don't pay this back. So your assessment fee is paid for, it comes out of your DSA. It comes out of that disabled student's allowance. So a student is gonna be paying that. Um, and, to, and in terms of the other support, depending what you're, you're recommended, there, there's no additional cost to you on that one. Um, like I said, the assessment fee that comes out of your, your DSA and depending if you're recommended a laptop, a DSA laptop or not, there may be a contribution from a student from that one. Um, but it's again, it's dependent on, on the recommendations and that conversation. Mm -hmm. that's so I, I appreciate that. It can be like, oh, have I got to pay this back? No, you haven't, uh, which is really big because ultimately you're, you can use this support whilst you study and actually after you study and outside of the, uh, the learning environment as well oh Isaac you know what thank you so much for that and, and sort of kind of talking us through not only what that journey looks like but also kind of using Chris as a case study for you know what that experience will be and actually we've had sort of kind of questions coming through and I think already one of your colleagues in admin is already firing off answers but I want to just sort of kind of bring in um, a couple of the comments that have been coming in through Isaac so firstly I just want to say we've got Carolyn watching from Wales this um, this lunchtime then we've got Lynn I think she's just rubbing it in when I was talking about the holiday days she's like I'm in the Algarve and this is the fantastic thing about this show isn't it I know right we're here rainy 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 UK and there she is sunning it up in the Algarve but wherever you're watching from we welcome you I mean it's great that we're able to sort of kind of import and share with you and have amazing guests like Isaac sharing with you his knowledge so that we can become even bigger better bolder career practitioners um so the question that got asked and and it seems to have been answered, but for those that can't see the comments, I just want to bring that in. So Joseph was asking, do you have to be registered disabled? So Isaac, I'll let you come in because I know one of your colleagues has answered. And also as well, there was another question. So I'll bring those in. And then I've got a, um, I've got one, one more question as well that I want to bring in as well, because this is where we're getting this interaction. So the first question is, do you have to be registered disabled? And then the other question is, is DSA available to students at the Open University as well? So answer to the first question, um, essentially it's about having a, a clear diagnosis of the disability. So if you, um, for example, if I go back to Chris and we'll say, uh, Chris has say, for example, you have dyslexia, like a specialist uh, teacher will diagnose that or an educational psychologist, and that needs to be kind of evidenced in the medical evidence that you send to your funding body. Um, so, and if it's a different uh, condition, be it a, say, mental health condition, it would be your your specialist mental health practitioner who actually make that diagnosis. And as long as that's clear and it's been diagnosed, then you can be, apply for DSA and you're eligible for this, this support. Um, so hopefully that kind of answers your question uh, for number one. And the second one about Open University, absolutely, yeah. We, we encourage Open University students to, to, to apply for this fund as well. Um, I should say that you don't have to be a full-time student for this fund at all. It's full-time, part-time, undergraduate, postgraduate, 
Um, it doesn't matter at what stage you're studying you're at, as long as it's a higher education course, so level four and above, so that can be a foundation, it can be a certificate of higher education, it could be initial teacher training, um, it could be any of those level four courses and above, you can apply for this fund. And like I said, part-time, as full-time students can apply for this as well. Just while we're on that subject, Isaac, um, just to kind of, because I know that there's a couple of areas which maybe aren't included where I think it's worth people perhaps looking elsewhere. I know we've had this conversation before. So if we're talking about maybe people who are looking at adult education, perhaps outside of higher education, so you're below level four, or maybe people who are kind of undertaking apprenticeships, um, right in saying it's a slightly different system and, and not linked to what we're talking about with DSA here. Yeah, it's slightly different. So that would be an apprenticeship which works in a similar fashion. Um, again, an internet search will be able to kind of clue you up in a bit more to signpost in the right direction that but essentially it would be a, a similar a similar thing to what we do in terms of DSA. And again, even if you're looking to go straight to the workplace and you have a, a disability that you'd like support in, there's something called access to work, which is a different scheme, uh, but it's, essentially it's, it's what we do, but in the workplace. Um, so those are a couple of different other avenues and where you can get funding uh, to, to help you overcome some difficulties that you face. Fantastic. Thank you for that, clearing that up. And am I right in thinking as well, I just want to make this super clear, that there's no age limit, is there, or age sort of kind of to the access to the support to the DSA, is there, Isaac? Absolutely not. So it, it, you can come in at any, any, any stage whatsoever. And I, I, I don't know the sort of the sort of students or people you guys speak to trying to get them back into either higher education or work, but anyone can apply for this. And we, we see students from all sorts of uh, all, all walks of life in terms of age demographic, which is fantastic to see because there's no barrier to education. I, I really think that should be kind of important that anyone can get into this, no matter how they feel at a certain age or disability impacting their learning, because ultimately that's what the DSA is about, removing the barriers and empowering students to kind of get to where they want to get to. I love that, Isaac. So that you heard it here first here on the Wheels Career Show, where Isaac has just dismissed a myth because maybe perhaps you started watching this show thinking, oh, this is just for, you know, sort of kind of late teens, early 20 something year olds. Actually, no, this support and this access to support can be made available. So if you're a practitioner and you're working with, say, for, for example, parents returning back into the workforce and work it, returning back into um, education, or you've got somebody who is now a mature learner and you were thinking, oh, this isn't for me. Well, guess what? Yes, it is. There is access and support available. Um, I'm just going to bring in some comments that have been coming in. We've got some hellos. We've definitely got a fan here, somebody that says it's great to see Isaac and hearing about DSA again. So you've clearly got a fan, somebody who's stalking you, Isaac. Um, I can't see the name, so I can't <laughs> reveal who that is. A bit late joining me to hello from Catherine. Hello, Catherine. Brilliant. Thank you so much um, for answering the questions. I think the viewers are really happy that you've got them with them. Um, and then we've got here, with an apprenticeship, you can apply for the ESFA, Educational Skills Funding Agency. So if you are working, if you are a practitioner, you're watching right now, and you've got, you know, you've got clients who are interested in apprenticeships or who are doing apprenticeships, that's really great to know. So thank you for that, admin at A to B. And then we've got here, it's great to learn about such an important assist, um, assistance. Thank you, Isaac. So you're getting some love and some appreciation, Isaac, from the community as well. Um, now... I've, I've got one question before I kind of hand it over to Chris, which was that for our viewers who might be interested in taking this conversation further, because I appreciate that in a sort of kind of 30 minute show, we can't cover every nook and cranny. And as Isaac said, you know, the service that you get offered is very personalized. It's tailored to that individual learner, that individual client that you are working with. We could possibly answer all of the sort of kind of different questions that you're going to have as a professional or that your client is going to have. So what are the best next steps for finding out more about the DSA support and promoting this with eligible, you know, clients and stakeholders that we as, you know, career professionals work with, Isaac? Sure. I mean, I'd certainly check out the UCAS website. It's really important. Um, so you can find out more about DSA there. The government website as well. Um, a quick Google search. You should put in DSA. The first link that will come up will be the government website. Uh, signposting you to sort of the the, the application phases of uh, DSA and also our website atbassessments.com uh, there's loads of information on there or just give us a call really um, we're, we're more than happy to kind of discuss that because it, it can be can be daunting when you're going through this system and applying for student finance in general is can be a bit daunting it's about removing those barriers and actually having a conversation with someone to get that support 
Um, so I actively encourage people to kind of get on the websites and, and pick up the phone to, to actually speak to someone and find out a bit more information because that will give you sort of a plethora of, of knowledge there to kind of help answer any of those questions that may come up and, and also remove the potential stress and anxiety of uh, discussing that disability because one thing that we're really aware of is actually discussing disabilities can be quite a sensitive topic. And, you know, we all know yeah. someone who, who, um, who, may, who may have a disability and it may impact their life to date, on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's important to kind of actually spread that message and have that conversation and make it, make it normal because it, it is <laughs> essentially. And that's really, really important. Um, and like I said, it shouldn't be a barrier to get into higher education and get into where you want to go, really. So that's really important to have that conversation. And I encourage you guys to kind of get in contact if you want to have a conversation, discuss it a bit further. Fantastic. And I'm, I'm right in saying, Isaac, I'm sorry, I've uh, got my volume turned up on two sides here. One second. Uh, so, yeah, I'm right in saying that you're, uh, I've got two screens here on the go just for viewers at home. So this is kind of why you might be getting a slight echo. It's gone now, thankfully. Um, but I'm right in saying, Isaac, you're, uh, you're happy for people to contact you on email as well if, if they'd like to kind of keep that conversation going further off the back of the show. Is that right? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely encourage that, guys. So uh, I don't know if you guys are going to put it in there, but, yeah, Isaac at atbassessments.com and admin at atbassessments.com. Uh, check us out and sort of fire emails across. That's probably the best way to get a hold of us. But like I said, I'm I'm old school, so feel free for a phone call as well. Uh, we'll we'll do our best sort of to answer your questions and discuss anything that may come up uh, DSA related or any signpost you in the right direction as well. Because um, ultimately, there is there's loads of sort of platforms out there and and uh, avenues to get to higher education, and it's it's about kind of connecting the dots from potentially if you're leaving a school leaver or if you're coming back into education and you need some extra support and you you know you are you do have a, a disability or something that impacts your learning uh then get in touch and we'll be more than happy to, to speak further and go from there really that that's brilliant thanks isaac i mean we're going to be sharing all of these resources so uh the websites that isaac's been mentioning contact details as part of our show resources document that goes out on the facebook community of practice so i'm going to pass over to sabir to tell us a little bit more about cbi facebook community of practice if people are watching this and never heard of it before uh, what is it why should people be aware of it and why do you get loads of nice free stuff if you join okay i'll oh, thank you for that chris so um you know one of the great things about this show is is that you can you don't need to be a member of the cdi community at all to get access to this because we're streaming live right now on linkedin youtube and then obviously we're streaming on the facebook community as well and one of the reasons why chris and i sort of kind of started this show in conjunction with the cdi was because we wanted we know how time poor so many of us are and so the great thing about the CDI Facebook community is, is that if you are time poor, if you are somebody who is sort of kind of overwhelmed, perhaps maybe you're working for an organization and you happen to be the only career professional within that organization, or you're working with a very small team, and you want to be able to access the latest relevant up-to-date sort of information that's happening that sort of kind of impacts not only you as a sort of career professional, but also you you and your clients the community that you serve that you're so passionate that you're so motivated about transforming and you want to be able to have the sort of kind of latest access this is what this community and this show is all about so what what you get more beyond the show if you're not a sort of kind of member obviously you get access to the show for free but if you want to access the extra level of support and guidance that's where you head on over to the CDI Facebook community. You can see Chris there pointing um, to the show as well. And you get then access exclusive um, freebies. You get the show resources that go to well, so many of the things that Isaac's talked about. That Also, Isaac has been so wonderful and so blessed to come on the show, but also as well, he's given us sort of kind of pointers and directions of where we should be going as career professionals, which we're going to include in this bonus resource. So that's where you want to head on over. And as I say, I, and I, I've said this before, so I know I'm repeating myself, but it's good to say it. It's literally less than a cost of a Starbucks coffee, Frappuccino, um, that you pay in terms of membership and you get access to, you know, fun, fantastic resources that Isaac is giving us and sharing with us today, but also a whole host of more resources as well that you're going to need to keep up to date with the latest sort of happenings in our sector, but also how best you can serve your clients as well. There was an additional um, question that came in that I just want to kind of pop in, um, Isaac, which was that, Isaac, do you, does your support, the support that you provide um, from A, at A to B go beyond England? Does it include sort of Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland? 
Essentially, yes. Um, so there's there's not just Student Finance England, there's a funding body, there's Student Finance Wales, there's Student Finance Northern Ireland, Scotland had their own one as well. There's also, depending what course you're doing, an NHS uh, social work bursaries and an NHS bursaries as well. So this all falls under the umbrella of, of DSA. Um, so yes, we can provide sort of support for, for students studying in those places who do have those funding bodies as well. Uh, so hopefully that answers your, your question to that one. Oh, thank you for that, Isaac. Go on, Chris. As we wrap up today's show, it always no, flies, that, doesn't it, Chris? It always flies. Go on. What have we, we said? I was just going to say that. Yeah, we, we're forever running out of time. This is the common theme of We Are Careers. But, Isaac, I mean, thanks so much for answering all those questions. Uh, we're going to keep you on if that's okay till the end in case any other questions come up. But uh, great news now, I'm sure, you know, on top of everything Isaac's provided, we've now also got the latest news stories from the CDI and the wider career sector. So I'm going to go over to Sabir first to start with our CDI news for this week. What are we looking at? What do kind of careers professionals need to keep an eye out for this week? Okay, so these are my top three picks for this week. We've got careers in 100 years, primary school competition. So if you are a career professional and you are currently working in the primary school sector, the CDI have launched a competition for primary school to design a recruitment process for a job in 100 years time. So you're kind of future thinking. The competition encourages pupils to widen their perspective on future jobs and it's open to primary schools across the UK. Now, the shortlisted entries will be judged by people attending the 100 Years of Career Celebration at Bliss Hill, Victorian Town on the 18th of June. Now, the details, more details about this can be found on the CDI website and entries need to be submitted by Friday, the 27th of May. So you've still got some time. So head on over there and take a look. Then my second news story is meeting friends. It's kind of follow through really from what we've been talking about now, which is the primary school competition, which is meeting friends and fellow colleagues at the 100 years of career celebration that is taking place at Bliss Hill, Victoria Town on the 18th of June. You know, after spending two years in one various form of lockdown, this is going to be the probably one of the first time is that we're going to get to meet together as a professional face to face. You know, the old fashioned way, as Isaac said, he talks about, you know, you know, picking up the phone. I love a good old fashioned net on the phone. Um, there's nothing wrong with that, especially in this day and age where we're all experiencing some level of Zoom fatigue. Um, so it's a great opportunity to meet up with friends and colleagues from across the profession and you know, have a cheeky drink as well and a bite to eat, um, which has been included in the price of your ticket as well. So go check that out. Again, all information is available on the website. And then finally, my third story was, should a career development be a chartered profession? This is what you are seeing right now being put out there. We're talking about it as professional. If you've not heard about it, it gives me great pleasure to be able to bring this to you. The CDI continue to explore the potential for career development to become a chartered profession like so many others. Um, and the survey is being run by ISEGS to capture the views of everyone working in the career development profession. So understanding the perspective of individuals and organisations across the um, community is critical to deciding whether or not chartership would be a positive for the sector. Whether you think you agree or you disagree, head on over and contact Nikki Moore. Um, an article about this is available in your Careers Matters. Again, another bonus that you get when you become a member of the CDI, where you can share your thoughts. So however you feel about that, head on over there, go check that out. So that's my selection top three stories for this week. Chris, what did you pick? Yeah, I've got three good ones, I think, Sabir. But yeah, first of all, I would just say, just to echo your point, you know, do complete that survey talking about should careers be a charter profession. Doesn't take necessarily as long as half an hour, but really useful just to kind of think on and reflect. And I, I came to some quite surprising conclusions, which I won't share. I won't try to influence anyone's opinion. But uh, it's really interesting to read about and kind of reflect and share your thoughts. So do go ahead and do that. So, yeah, I've got kind of three stories which I'm going to include in the show resources, but I really want to focus on. I want to direct people towards. Um, number one is the Squiggly Careers podcast. So if people haven't heard that before, Sarah Ellis, Helen Tupper, some fantastic kind of episodes. I think they've done almost 300 episodes now, all about kind of looking at nonlinear careers and how to manage your kind of career pathway. They've got a really good episode just out on how to use kind of experiments within your kind of current role to kind of accelerate career development. Development. Really interesting, very, very relevant for a lot of the work we do as careers professionals. And um, the second article that I'd like to signpost people towards is the Career Catalyst. So that's Anne Wilson from uh, 
Warwick University. She has a great blog out about the lifeline activity. So if you get one of those questions in an interview, you know, what's your, what's your proudest accomplishment? She's got a really great suggestion of doing this career lifeline zero to where you are now and plotting your highs and lows and using those as a way of actually kind of thinking and reflecting on what were my really high points, you know, and what were maybe my low points and, and what did that you know, kind of make me think about my career. What did that make me reflect on? What did I learn from those moments? Really, really useful. And then a little bit of a teaser for my third uh, sort of story today. Uh, it's a video from Chris Target, who we mentioned earlier in the show for CXK about apprenticeships versus university. Why not both? Where he challenges quite a lot of the myths around, you know, university versus apprenticeships debate, opening up things about, you know, when you do them at uh, the different ages that you can do them at and really challenging people to think about not making that a black or white debate. Uh, and that fits really, really nicely into our next episode, which I'm going to flash up on the screen, which is coming up on Wednesday, the 25th of May at 12 o'clock. We're going to be welcoming author Michael Tafua, who's going to be talking about his new book, Is Going to Uni Worth It? And again, as Sabir mentioned earlier, it's not just about thinking about um, uh, careers professionals working with young people coming just out of secondary school or just coming out of college. And we're very much talking about it as a kind of spectrum, you know, university versus apprenticeships as a kind of uh, topic, is it worth it? That's the title of Michael's book, but actually we want to take this into a much less binary argument and a much more nuanced argument. And that's hopefully what we're going to try and pack into, if we can, 30 minutes in two weeks time. So that's our next show coming up. Please do join us then. Um, all that's left to say really is a massive thank you to Isaac for joining us today and for sharing his insights and thoughts. A uh, huge thank you to those of you uh, watching at home and obviously the, the wider CDI team that support the show. And of course, a massive thank you to Sabir for being a fantastic co-host as always. Thank you and goodbye, everyone. We'll see you in the next show. Have a great week. See you next time. Bye.